Welcome to episode two of The Threat Report. We got something a little different for you tonight. Uh, we're filming in the midst of the World Series, so I just wanted to say... Go Nats. Go Nats. Go Nats. I don't want to date it, so I won't say how they're <laughs> doing, but it's still ongoing and uh, things are looking good. Um, today we're going to go over some hobby stuff. Yeah. Uh, so what we have is we have a range of tools, equipment, stuff you need for getting into the hobby. So we've noticed that like on the Reddit and the, MC, uh, and the MCP Facebook, there seems to be a lot of new people into the hobby in general. I know the IP is such a juggernaut, it's bringing bring new people in. So we want to make sure we can help whoever we can just like get into the hobby of tabletop miniature gamings. Uh, so hopefully we answer any of the questions that you might have been having, especially specifically with what tools, what paints, what brushes, things like primers, palettes, um, just all along those lines so you can just, just get ready. So on day one, you're ready to start putting the kit together. I know, I've only been in the hobby for a little over two years and it was a lot of trial and error. I had never done it before. Um, I wish there had been a video like this to actually walk me through some of the stuff because a lot of you, especially <clears throat> the huge Marvel fans that have never done miniature gaming before are going to bring the course at home. They're going to open it up and they're going to look at it and they're going to be like, what the hell do I do with this? Yeah. Um, it can, so it, this video is to help with that. Yeah, it can be daunting, but we would hopefully make it as simple as possible. Um, again, if you're a veteran of tabletop gaming or even intermediate intermediate with tabletop gaming, this video is probably not for you. Mm -hmm. It's not really targeting you. This is for brand new people that have never really done the hobby before, or just heard about it. Um, but if you want to stick around, we'd appreciate it. Um, again, my name is Ryan. I'm John. Uh, and this is Threat Level Gaming with the Threat Report. Hey guys, let's start with what you're going to need to build the miniatures that are going to come in your starter set. Um, the most important tools to, get, to help you get the stuff off the sprues that are going to come in there are going to be these right here. So you have your clippers and you have your blades. Um, famously, X-Acto knives. Uh, these are the kind of your bread and butter as a hobby tool. Um, you can use them to cut things off sprues. You can uh, file down models, scrape extra bits off them cut little pieces off. Um, really, really important just to have this available for all times. Um, for help, to help you get the model off the sprue itself though, this is my best recommendation, are these clippers. They're basically just wire clippers. Um, you can get these ones from Amazon for pretty dirt cheap. Uh, these ones right here are branded ones. Um, more expensive, but they look prettier. So if you're into that, you can spend a little more. But basically what you're doing... Do you think they work any differently? No, they're about the same. Um, this one's actually probably a little bit springier than this one. I kind of like this better. Um, but this does have a better ergonomic feel if you're into that kind of stuff, like I said. Um, but basically what you're doing, you're going to line this back part up with the, uh, the sprue, the part that's away from the model, clip it, do it all around, good to go. Um, another good tool is this right here is a file. So when you clip the model off the sprue, uh, they're going to be a little bit extra bumps. You can use this file down. And there are... Uh, mold lines on plastic miniatures usually. Um, it's going to run down the side of the model. Um, what just, is a mold line? It's basically like where the mold is injected and it just creates a little piece of extra plastic where there's... And this will just help you scrape off the uh, extra bits and smooth it down. Or if you want to do any kind of like hobby and you can, you know, if you want to do some customization, you can file down stuff as well. All right, so that's the basics for the cutting part. Um, the next big thing is super glue. So I've heard a lot of questions about what super glue to use. So from what I've seen is that they are plastic models. So generally, unless IMG did some weird formula with their models, I doubt it, so it should be fine. So you have two options. You have super glue, which is just regular super glue um, that you used to, you've been using forever, or you have plastic cement. What this does is that so it only works on plastic models, but it essentially melts the models together. So the bond, once it's fully set, is basically unbreakable unless you break the actual model. Super glue um, can be used on metal, plastic, resin. So it's more versatile, but doesn't necessarily build up strong as bond as this does for plastic. And you do have the issue of getting super glue on your fingers, which sucks. It does suck. Yeah. I learned that the hard way. Yeah, so it'll, it'll be there. You have to peel it off. It's annoying. Um, some things you have to use, like I said, if it's not plastic, you can't use this. Um, you'll have to use this, but you should, you should probably have both. If you have the option, I recommend using this, though. The other thing with plastic glue, and, and I learned this is another thing I learned the hard way, is that that plastic cement will actually melt the plastic. 
So if you use too much of it, if you get if you smear it on the model too much, it will actually start turning your model into like goop. Yeah, I've you, actually done that to my model. Yeah, if you get it too far, if you get it over details, you can mess up some details. So just be it comes with a I'll show you. It comes with a little um, skinny applicator like this, so it's easy to apply. And uh, I apologize in advance. I actually use these tools. These are my for my personal collection. So you're gonna see paint crust and glue crust all over it. Um, but uh, this stuff's really cool. Um, so for super glue, so you have your super glue, you can use this stuff. This stuff is accelerator. So one of the big annoying things about super glue is that you'll have to hold the pieces together for some time on certain models, especially if the bond's not, if it's just like a weird day or something's not happening. You spray this on there and it'll instantly cure the super glue. The downside is, is that the bond is weaker and you can sometimes get like weird white fuzzy things around where the glue was. Um, but if you like say break something in an event, using this on this to fix it is super nice. Or if you just can't get this one piece to hold, you don't want to hold it anymore, it's option, totally optional. So, but there's that too. Um, finally for the tools are some little extra ones. Uh, so this is right here is green stuff. Um, if you've never heard of it, it's basically a two-part epoxy. You mix together uh, blue, the one's a, like a, uh, the clay and the retarder, so it determines how hard it gets. Um, so you mix them together to you turn it green, and you can use it to fill gaps. Um, you can actually do a little bit of uh, modeling with it. So a lot of people will take uh, a big chunk of this and like maybe make, make a cape or make um, fur on the shoulders and stuff like that. Um, a little more advanced, but it's not a it's a it's a pretty useful tool once you get comfortable with it. The most general use for it, at least when I first started, was sometimes, especially when you're new, putting together plastic models. Um, they won't fit together perfectly either because of the mold that you were given, the model you were given, or because you clipped it too much or too little. That fills cracks. Like so, when if you're putting Iron Man's chest piece together and you notice that on one side it's not sitting as flush as it should be. Well, that is going to show up in paint. Like you'll have a hole there forever. Green stuff is is a tool that you would use to fill out that fill that hole over, you know, file it down. And even though it looks green, once you prime it and paint it, it, no one will ever know that there's green stuff there. It will look like Iron Man's chest piece is a, a fit, you know, perfectly flush piece. Yeah. Um, so the last one for the tool part is uh, blue uh, blue tack. It's the stuff you used in. College, some call, people call it a poster board tack. Um, I use this stuff primarily to stick models to bases before I, they're painted, um, just so that when I want to, if I want to, when I want to prime them, uh, I can take the model off first and just not set in there. I can get to the base easier after I'm done painting. Um, again, optional, but I find that I use a lot, this stuff a lot. If you really want to do <clears throat> intense work painting your bases, or if you're a little bit intimidated by moving around a character's feet. Or something like that you can still play while they're in the process of being painted you connect it to the base with the blue tack and then when you take it home you can take it off the base and then continue to paint your base i don't do that i should because i'm not good at painting around feet yeah. you know so. and neither am i that's why i was right. doing the blue tack um all right so there's a lot of tools there but so if i was going to do the most important ones are um one of the super glues, if you had to choose one, you go with the super glue because it's more versatile. Um, one of the clippers, cheap one's fine, and one of the hobby knives. Those are your three TLDR most important tools that you need for putting together your models right out of the box. So the next one is paint. Um, one of the coolest parts of this hobby is that you get to paint your own models, make them look however you want. You can do comic authentic, you can do comic not authentic, um, alternative schemes, you know, Spider-Man, black costume. Oh, black costume Spider-Man. Beyonder Spider-Man, et cetera. You can do all kinds of stuff. And it's your models, do whatever you want. Um, but these are some of the basics you're going to need to, um, a, these are the basic paints you're going to need to get the job done. So for any of these models, after you put them together, one of the important things is to prime them. What the priming does is it gives you a good base coat for your paint, and it allows it stops from chipping, and it gives you a good flat surface paint on that's not just the uh, plastic. It basically itself. gives your paint something to grab onto, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so there's a lot of options. 
So you have ones like this. This is like your automobile primer you're going to get from Home Depot. Um, really affordable, really actually really good quality. Um, super easy to find. Is there any downside to using something that's made for automobiles? Um, I mean, there's like a big dispute about whether these are good enough or not. What I, what's good about them is that, like I said, they're, they're super available, they're cheap, um, and they do a really good job. You have a less wide color palette mm. to put them in because generally you're gonna have like the primary colors plus like black, white, gray, um, but they're a good option. Um, the next one, you're going to get your um, branded ones. So these are two major big brands. You have Army Painter and... We're not uh, affiliated with yeah, any, it, We're not affiliated yeah. or sponsored by any of the brands you may see. Yeah, on just so you know, there's nothing... So Stolium is not paying us money. To... <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Um, so you have things like Army Painter. They have a, a wide range of colors that, that gives you like a... You can half paint your model by that way. So like they'll have a few want to do a bunch of red models, you can get the red primer. Uh, same thing with uh, Games Workshop, another big brand. The issue with these ones, especially going this way, is in price. Uh, this one is pretty expensive for one can of primer, um, but I really like them. They're, they do a really smooth coat, especially these newer ones that they've come out with. Um, but these are really good go-to ones that people really enjoy. Um, one of the things, that, so one of the things, make sure it's not too hot outside, make sure it's not too cold outside. We had a buddy who had, when it was in really cold weather up here in uh, the D.C. area, he tried to spray and the can blew up in his hand, so watch out for that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, so you can do it in different colors. There's the major colors that for priming are either black, gray, or white, um, but like I said, you can do different colors if you want to just like get a base coat down uh, really quick. And if you do happen to use one of these spray cans to prime in temperatures that are either too, it's usually the humidity more than the heat. Um, if it's too humid, you'll notice that instead of being a perfectly smooth, even coat, it will look fuzzy. Yeah, it'll have like little fuzzy grainy, it'll be actually gritty. So it'll actually it'll ruin, gritty, it's, yeah. uh, like ruin your paint job when you try to put this, kind of trying to do that. So you got your primer down. What kind of paints do you want, do you want to put on there? So this is, Probably could be 10 different videos itself, but this is just going to go over some basic levels. Ten, yeah, like 100? Yeah, 100. Yeah, it's probably better. Um, different levels of paint that you can buy. So this one first is like typical craft store, uh, 70 cent acrylic paint that, you know, you probably use for art projects and stuff like that. So there are some people that can make good paint jobs with this. Um, I am not one of them. The, the pigment's not great. Um, they're tricky to get thinned right. Um, I wouldn't recommend this for painting your models. Uh, you mentioned thinning your paints? Yeah, that's, it's, I'll get to that in okay. a bit. Um, so this part, so this here would, is just difficult to do on models to get a good smooth finish so it doesn't look thick or chunky. Now, like I was saying, people can do it, but I think for a beginner, this is too difficult to work with to recommend. Now, what you can do is use this for uh, big terrain projects where it doesn't need to be as quite as a clean paint job, paint job especially if you're doing things like um, ruined buildings or warehouse district or something that can look ratty and a little bit beat up. Um, but yeah, so there's these ones. But they are super cheap, so if you're on a super tight budget, I'd rather you play and do this than not get anything. Uh, so the next. So the next one are your, I would say, the mid-range, big brand, uh, boutique store um, paints. These are the ones that are going to run you about $4, um, 4 to $5 a piece. Um, they have really good pigments. Um, these are generally people that make paints for miniatures, so they've formulated them better. Um, they're easier to use. You have, a, like I said, an infinite range of colors. Um, each paint has like its own little different properties like thickness, um, opacity. So it's, this is kind of where you get to um, get some brand loyalty. So if you find some paints that you really like, stick with those. There's plenty of those. Or you can be, you know, paint polygamous and just go whatever with you want. <laughs> Um, yeah, so these ones are 
classic, you know, Games Workshop, Privateer Press. Vallejo is a Spanish company. These are a little bit harder to find in all four of these players are a little bit harder to find in not specific game stores, but they're all over Amazon. Um, any game store will have some variety of these. Um, some some of the bigger hobby stores carry Vallejo now. Um, but yeah, so these are your ones. So you have different ones. You have like this one. So they're pots that you open up. Um, you take them and you put them on your palette, which I'll go over in a second. And these little pots actually, even though they seem small, there's enough paint in them for many models. Yeah, this. I mean, these paints will last you at least a couple... I mean, like 100 models probably. I could probably get like a good... Like... Yeah, if you're painting normal crisis protocol size models, unless you want to paint every character, for instance, red, yeah. then maybe that would, you know, you'd run out of it quicker. But even if you did 100 Spider-Men, that red would probably be able to cover the 100 red parts of a Spider-Man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this stuff is good. And then um, there's also like, you know, there's preferences for dropper bottles, which are a little easier, a lot easier to get out of the bottle. You can just drip them on your palette. Um, but these are your workhorses for this hobby. So if you can find a brand you like, find a good deals, I would go with these ones. Um, now, there are some more ones like this. This is from uh, Scale 75. These are more, I'd say, like high-end boutique paints. Um, they're a bit more expensive. They're a lot harder to get. You usually can get them from like their stores and stuff like that. Um, you're not going to usually get to find the discounts you'll find on onesies like this. Um, they're really cool colors. They usually have like super opacity or super transparent. You can do cool stuff with them. But these are more, you know, after you've practiced and you're starting to get comfortable with the paint before you start investing in the high-end paints. But if you if you like them, go ahead and use them. Um, so there is a new paint kit on the block. Um, so Games Workshop a couple months ago put out these paints. They're called Contrast. Uh, so what's really neat about them is that the idea is that you can paint a model from base coat primer. So you use a primer like uh, the one I showed. Like they use like their primer, and then you go with just one coat of this, and you should be good to go. So when you're painting with other paints, you're generally supposed to like thin it down so you get a smooth coat, and you have to take a couple coats on it sometime to get good coverage. But the idea behind these is that one thick coat and you're done. So you're supposed to just paint it, slap it on there, let it dry for a half hour and it's good to go. And it will also do kind of like the highlighting job for you. Yeah, highlighting and shading is kind of built into it. Uh, that's the theory of it anyway. Um, some paints, some of these colors work better than others. Again, we're not sponsored by anybody, but I think this is a really, really good tool for people that are just getting into the hobby. Uh, my brother started getting into the hobby just a couple months ago, and he's been using nothing but contrast paints to get on his models, and he's been doing pretty good. Uh, really just banging out models really quick and, it's, and, a, and a really good quality, better than I was when I was first starting painting, uh, just slapping thick paint on there. Um, so these are a little bit more expensive too, but the pots last you a while, and um, it's just a good option. I would check it out if you have them there. And then the last part is, so after your models are painted, you're going to want something like this is a clear coat. You can also get dull coat or a varnish. Um, it just, it's a spray um, that you just spray on after your model's done drying, and it just protects it. So if you take it places and you drop it, it won't chip. It'll last longer. And if you have, like, some glossy paints in there that you didn't intend, things like this will bring it back down into, like, the matte spectrum. Um, so that's it for paints for now. So we'll move on to what you need to put the paints on with. All right, so now we're going to talk about the next super contentious issue in the hobby world is paint brushes. Um, so here is a, cole a selection of them. So all heavily used. Yes, these are all heavily. Uh, ignore the paint. Um, <laughs> so this is another issue where you can have you know a super affordable version versus a pretty expensive one, um, and of course you're going to get varying degrees of quality between the uh, two ends. Um, but we'll start with the, again, the most basic ones. So these are ones you'll find at a hobby store. Um, they're super cheap. I think this came in a pack of five for five bucks. Um, they, they do work somewhat. Again, I don't know if these are really something I want to recommend because, yes, you they're super cheap, but they're going to wear out super quick. And they generally have like lower quality bristles. They don't hold a lot of paint. 
Um, they're just funny. So you're going to just be replacing these a lot. So the money you're saving by buying these is going to get uh, added up over time just because you're going to have to keep replacing them because they won't like really hold their tip or anything like that. Um, and how do you know when the brush is worn out? Like a, a brush that's on the low end like this, what will it start to look like? It'll start, yeah, it? it'll start to fray. It'll start to actually kind of look like this. It'll start to fray at the end. It won't really hold a tip anymore. It'll have little pieces of bristles that'll start shooting off and it's just really frustrating and like you're trying to paint something and then like a little piece of line comes off and it just drives you crazy. Um, again, I've seen people do really good work with this type of brush. Um, but again, they were like professional painters and they knew what they were doing really, really well. Um, so there's those, um, again, affordable. If you know, if you're on a tight budget, I'd rather you paint with this than nothing. The next ones are your branded, like the ones like the, uh, army painter Citadel paints. Uh, these are their brushes that they generally make as well. So these are solid workhorse medium range brushes. Um, you'll get pretty good use out of them. They generally have pretty good tips. Um, they have a wide variety of sizes. Like this is a medium glaze brush. They also have like a medium shade brush and a medium base layer brush and stuff like that. Um, like a medium base brush. Um, you can find these at, like I said, again, at pretty much any game store. Um, so they're accessible. They're not too expensive. They're probably around the anywhere from seven to ten dollar range. So affordable, and if you take care of them, they can still do really good work with them, and you won't have too much frustration with them. I've kind of let these go. So like these are like my mixing brushes and lots of like that. Um, now as far as types of brushes, um, well let me show you these other ones. So these are the higher end boutique brushes. Um, these are the ones that cost a, a pretty penny each, around twelve to seventeen bucks per the brush, depending on what size. Um, but they are, you get what you pay for. They're really, really nice brushes. If you take care of them, they will last uh, years. Um, if, you, if you make sure you clean them, soap them, everything like that. Um, if you can uh, afford it, I recommend trying to get some of these ones just because it'll, they'll give you the least amount of frustration when you're trying to start out painting. Um, but again, I can understand that the cost can be a little bit prohibitive on these guys. Um, so now we're talking as for what sizes to buy of the yeah, brushes. Yeah, I noticed there's many different sizes here. And I know when I first got into the hobby, it was really intimidating to see 10 different size brushes. And of course, anytime you go to a store and ask which ones you need, they're always going to say, well, all, all 10 <laughs> do 10 different jobs. So if you want to paint your models, all 10 have to do a specific purpose and they have a, a specific function. And it was overwhelming to come out of a store with 10 different brushes and now, after being a couple years in the hobby, I realized that you need far less than 10 different sized brushes. So which ones would you recommend here? Robert? Yeah, so out of these ones that I have in front of me, and this is the general, it's generally size two is what I'd recommend if you see a brush that has, comes in actual number sizes. Um, because which the, the thing is, is that it doesn't matter how thick really this brush is, it's more of a how good of a tip it has. Um, so it, you, you can still paint eyes, um, tiny miniature as long as the tip on this brush is uh, really well defined so you don't need a super thin brush like this to paint eyes um, this is actually kind of better in a lot of ca cases because it'll hold more paint so you don't have to keep going back to the um, to the paint to fill it back the brush it won't dry as fast in the bristles um, but if you want to get, if you're a little uncomfortable trying to like paint with the little tips of this, you can go down to like a one. I'd stay away from like the zeros and the zero zeros. Um, unless you have, you have like one, br one yeah, hair bristle on. on them. Yeah. So unless you have a very specific reason, I'd probably try to stick with a one or a two as your main brush. Now some other brushes are you have like dry brushes. So dry brushes, they sell specific dry brushes now. Um, but for the longest time before that was saying, we would just, painters would just use old brushes. Uh, that have kind of worn out and you just what this is for is for um, when you're doing a technique that has you load up the paint wipe most of it off and you kind of just brush it over we'll probably have a video at some point yeah. demonstrating it so. yes and i'm sure so you, you can just you know well, you, you, can, you can youtube dry brushing <laughs> right. for, for, for now and see a million videos yeah and i'll just give you like a light dusting of the and just hit the raised area so dry brush isn't terrible um, again you don't need to have it um, and then this, this is a larger brush for putting on like washes and shades for big things. 
like a ter- like the terrain pieces. And yeah, the so set would be something that that would be useful. Correct. For. Like these are like because you don't want to try to. It's it's even a, even a brush this big is going to be annoying to paint the larger pieces of terrain. So a little bit bigger brush just to get the the paint on the terrains is uh, good for that. Um, so that's it for the brushes. The next thing is like what you know you hear things people talk about palettes and stuff like that. So this is a regular palette. This is just a, basically a piece of paper. You take the paint out of the bottle, put it in here. You can mix colors together, uh, add water to thin it down. Um, and then there's also a wet palette. A wet palette is basically just a piece of wax paper over either a paper towel or a sponge that it keeps absorbs just enough water to keep this surface wet. So when you wet down the paints, they don't dry out as fast. Um, they make it so your paints last longer, and you don't have to worry about... Uh, the paint drying as quickly, um, but either surface is definitely usable. Or you can use, this can just be like a tile, um, an upside down paper plate, there's tons of options just to put, put the paint on. Of course, you also need a water cup. This is a branded water cup. You obviously don't need a branded water cup. You can use paper cups. I literally um, use a coffee mug. Yeah, I don't just don't drink the, <laughs> don't don't drink the paint out. water. Which you, If you have a coffee cup, you will inevitably drink the coffee water or the paint water. Um, but just so, because you're going to mix the brushes, every time you use them, you're going to dip them in, spin around, get the paint, it's where you get your water from. So that's a really important thing to have by you. Um, another big thing that's been popping up recent years are these paint handles. So what you do is you stick the model in this base, um, and then it gives you a handle to hold. When you're Instead of like keeping your fingers on the, around the rim of the base of the model as you're spinning it, you just paint it like so. There's different versions of like these like handle ones. This one's more like you hold it like this. And you, uh, you put a little bottle cap and stick some blue tack on there, and you can paint it that way. So there's a lot of options for that, too. Um, and But one of the most important tools that I just don't think other people stress enough about this for new people are is this brush soap. Um, you don't have to use this brand, but this is a really classic one. It's Master's Brush Cleaner. Um, it's just a bar of soap that you take your brushes after you're finished painting with them. After you wash them. You with dip the them in the water and you take them with water and you swirl them around, get the stuff. You can build the tip back up, wash it, and this will make your brushes last so much longer. It was a real game changer. I was trying to paint with the same brushes, just rinsing the paint off, and the brushes were deteriorating so quickly, even when I tried to really take care of them. And then I started using the brush soap, and it's like... It is night and day. Like yeah. it really, it really cleans your brushes and yeah. preserves. This is super. I think it's like five dollars on Amazon, um, and I've been using this particular thing for four or five years now. It's super worth it. One of the biggest, best investments you can get for taking care of your brushes is habit. It's really, it really important. Yeah, yeah. Prices like you can't afford not to buy it. Um, <laughs> For the last thing, another thing speaking about like brush care, make sure you clean it off. Don't let the paint sit on the brush too long. Um, don't let the brush sit in water. Yeah, don't let the brush sit up. Don't yeah, don't ever like leave it like this in water. Um, and try to keep paint away from this part right here. It's called the ferrule. It's where the brushes, the bristles are connected to the um, the brush itself. Because if you get paint in there and it dries, it'll like flay the brushes like the bristles like that. So which you don't, you definitely don't want to happen. Um, so. That's basic stuff. So that's about it for the tools that we have. Um, yeah, so I hope this stuff was useful. If you have any other ideas that can pop up as far as questions, let me know. If you think I said something completely wrong, let me know. Um, if you have any experiences you want to share to other new hobbyists, please leave the comments below as well. And uh, yeah, that's it. All right, well, that wraps up episode two of the Threat Report. We went through some hobby stuff. Ryan, that was great. Thank you for uh, leading us through that. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. We'll have in the, um, underneath this video, we'll have the links for our Facebook, Instagram, our sure. email. Feel free to contact us. Feel free to review us. Constructive criticism, always welcome. Yeah, and uh, I guess maybe we can throw some links out for some Amazon pages for some of this stuff where you need to oh, for sure. for find some, some of these tools and stuff like that. But uh, thanks for listening. I'm Ryan. I'm John. And we'll see you. We'll see you next week.